And that's the way, see that, that is a different attitude. It's a different attitude. It's a different way of looking at things. And so as saints of God, we, we ought to have a different attitude. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. See, you got to have, you have a, a different attitude. Jesus wasn't on the cross saying, get me down. Jesus was on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Different attitude. Good morning. We want to welcome you to our Sunday morning broadcast. Pastors David and Donna Spearman welcome you. Welcome to Kingdom First, located here in Fort Wayne. As we say, God loves Fort Wayne. But now, let's get into this power pack message.
Fellowship. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for bringing us here this morning. We thank you for touching our bodies. Unshakable, unshakable, unstoppable. 
good. Welcome to Kingdom First, and uh, this is our communion Sunday. So we will have communion right after the message this morning. We want to welcome all those who are watching by streaming live. Thank you for being with us today. God bless you, and we pray that this message will be a, a, a good one for you, not just a good message, but life-changing. Because after all, that's what we're here to do to change or help change or help people change their lives. Um, this is like the hospital. You come here to get well. You come here to get well. Our message this morning is, oh, before we get to that though, let me uh, announce it wasn't on the announcements. Uh, on August 27th, August 27th, we will uh, have our back to school Sunday. And that includes such things as we pray over all the children and young people and adults who are in school. Uh, we give a blessing to them that they will do, do well, not only do well, but they will be excellent in their studies, all uh, educators, we pray for them. And on that Sunday, we also have uh, a lot of stuff going on outside. We'll have a carnival type atmosphere, or food trucks and tattoo artists, not real tattoos, but you know, the henna stuff and you know, the stuff you can wash off. Uh, we'll have uh, the, uh, what is it, the horse and buggy guy coming around. He'll be taking rides and uh, Petting zoo, I believe we're going to have the petting zoo and the character artist and the face painting and a bunch of other stuff. It's just going to be a lot of stuff, plus a couple of food trucks. So we'll have all that out there, and that will run from, our, we'll probably start our service at about 9.30 that Sunday so we can give ourselves a little time to get back out there and get everything together. And uh, then we'll, and then the outside activities will really start at about 11.00. Um, and run until, was it 2 o'clock? Yep, 2 o'clock. So, uh, so 9.30 to 2 o'clock. And so it's going to be a good time. Everybody's going to be blessed. Uh, it's going to be a great time. We'll have a DJ also. So, you know, we won't, uh, you won't have me trying to spin some records. So we'll have a DJ and all that. All right. Huh? Ain't nothing like Motown, that's right. Because if I spend some records, y'all gonna be listening to Four Tops and Temptations and Marvin Gaye and that's it, you know. <laughs> that's it. So anyway, amen. All right, this Sunday, we, we, we just got done talking about last week, we finished up our five steps of discipleship. And we talked about the fact that as believers, we, we have to have a mature faith and we're striving to have this mature faith and lead others to a mature faith. So just because I get it, I don't stop. I'm now bringing others along with me to reach that place of having a mature faith. Our, our, our lesson this morning is living your best life. Living your best life. And I firmly believe that we can live our best lives now. Now, a lot of folks talk about living their best life, and the world says, yeah, we, they want to live their best life, and they're doing everything they can to try and live their best life. I, I don't know about today, but I can remember back when I was in college and, and all that, that, you know, I had friends that took a year out of college to go find themselves, trying to find what their life was all about. You, you, you had, uh, uh, well, I mean, it was a real thing. People still do it today. They're, they're, going, they're going all over the world trying to find themselves, trying to find out what, why am I here? What's my purpose? Uh, we, we've had several great pastors uh, who have written books and preached on purpose, what your purpose is. Uh, in fact, one pastor wrote several books about the purpose-driven church and the purpose-driven person and, and so forth. And the pastor from Bahamas who wrote about purpose years and years ago, finding our purpose. Because believe it or not, even we in the church have to find our purpose. We can't just say, well, you know, I'm saved, that's it. No, we have, we have a purpose. And, and we need to live our best lives. Amen? 
The world says find out what your best life is and, and that's based on your emotional happiness. Whatever makes you emotionally happy, whatever you know, puts a smile on your face, uh, good times, good times. And so some find their good times and, and being around a bunch of folk and drinking. Others find their good times and being around a bunch of folk and, and, and you know, partying this way or that way. And they, they oh, I'm living, you know, I'm living my best life. Well, I can tell you that's really not your best life because there is a purpose that God has made us for. He didn't make us just to make us. Everything God does, everything he, he has, has done down through, the, uh, down through eternity, Everything he has done, he has done with a purpose. Everything is made for a purpose. Everything he made on this planet has a purpose, and that includes you. And your purpose is not just to, you know, have a job and make some money and get a Cadillac or whatever your favorite car might be. That's not your purpose. You have a deeper purpose, a better purpose than that. Amen? Living your best life, listen to this very carefully, living your best life is not what you think it should be. Living your best life is what God says it should be. I'm going to say it again. Living your best life is not what you think it should be, but what God says it should be. So then what we've got to do in order to live our best life is find out what God says my purpose is. What does God say I'm supposed to do? I'm supposed to be. I, ha I, ha I may have a lot of dreams and aspirations about this or that or the other. may want to do all manner of things. But what does God say I should be doing? Because what God says my life should be, that's going to be my best life. And it won't get any better than what God says it should be. You get where I'm coming from? So the only way you're going to ever know what your best life is, and I know, and, 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 and I'm with you, you know, if I had, you know, billions of dollars or millions of dollars, I could live a pretty good life. At least that's what we think. But people with millions and billions of dollars have problems too. <laughs> you may have $100 problems, thousand dollar problems or maybe even ten thousand dollar problems but they have million dollar problems and billion dollar problems you know not to say money doesn't help but it doesn't solve every problem it doesn't do everything you need to do in fact it will not get you your best life so the thing you need to do is find out what is God saying to me what has God, what has God declared my life should be? Even before the foundations of the world, even before anything, God had already determined what your best life should be. Let me give you a couple of ways that, in general, that help you understand what your best life is. According to God, one of the ways your life can be the best life is living a kingdom life. A life that is absolutely, positively, always in the kingdom of God. Now you may say, well, I'm here in this world, yeah, but I'm also in the kingdom. You may say, yes, but I'm, I'm ruled and governed by, by the, the authorities, the physical authorities and, and, and man-made governments. Yes, I may be, but I'm also ruled by a government that has not been made by hand a government that is made by God, a government that has been declared by God, a government that God says is his. And that government takes precedent over any and everything else. Amen? So one of the best ways I can live my best life is to live a kingdom life. Another way, uh, in addition to that, I should say, I don't want to say aside from that, but in addition to that, uh, I can, uh, living my best life is a life free from the penalty of sin. In other words, a justified life. A life where I've been justified, a life where I've been made, uh, a, de declared not guilty. I'm, I'm going to tell you, there's nothing worse than having this sword of death over your head, but when you're free from that, when you no longer have that over you, that's, man, you, you, you can begin to live a good life. You, you can have, that's, that's freedom right there. 
And so because of what Jesus did for us and because I put my faith in him, faith alone in Christ alone, I'm, I'm able to be set free from the penalty of sin. I can live my best life without the, without the baggage of death hanging over me. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Because see, it's important because otherwise what happens is death becomes your constant companion. It becomes a thing that you always wonder and worry about. But when you're free from that worry, oh my goodness gracious, there, there's so many things I can do and so many places I can go, so much I'm able to perform for God because I no longer have that, that concern and that worry over me. Another way I can live my best life in addition to living a kingdom-filled life, living a life that is a justified life, is living a sanctified life or a life free from the power of sin over me. In other words, no longer does sin have authority or power over me. I'm no longer a slave, but instead it is something that was in my past and is gone, and now I'm free. I am free to live a life without the slave master determining my footsteps. I don't know about you, but I don't, wanna, I don't want my footsteps determined by sin and death. I want my footsteps determined by the glory of God, by God determining my footsteps. Here's the good news. Here's the good news. All three of these scenarios are available for you today. Every single one. You can live a kingdom life. You can be free or you can have a justified life. You can have a sanctified life. The good news is we can have that. Today. That's not something in the future. That's not that. Now, there's an eternal life we have. Yes, praise God. And we're also going to live that throughout all eternity. But these are things we can live and have right now, including eternal life. We can live and have right now and be free from all those things that, 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 the squeeze and, and, and put pressure on people. That pressure is off of you. And because you're free from that pressure, see, I'm t listen, when you're free from pressure, man, they, boy, all of a sudden the air is clearer. You can breathe a little deeper. You know, when you're free from pressure, man, when, when you don't have that pressure on you uh, of sin, you don't have the pressure of death over you, when you don't have the pressure of you can't get out of where you are, you can't find your way out, there's, there's no light in the darkness, when, you, when you've got all that pressure off of you, man, I'm telling you, all of a sudden, it's just like, it's like a brand new day. It's like a brand new day. And it's a life that God wants you to have. It's a life that God wants you to, 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 to wrap yourself around and be involved with, a life that lives and is, is above the life of others. It's a life that others should look at you and aspire to have what you have. You know, when you look at the church and you look at Christians and you see us, and when we don't look any different from the world, that's a problem. That means that we have not walked in the freedom of living our best lives. We're not living our best lives. We're not living the life that God wants us to live. We're not having, now listen, this doesn't mean that trouble won't come your way. This doesn't, this doesn't mean that hardship won't come your way. But see, hardship comes to everybody. But the difference between us and the world is how we handle the hardships and the trouble that come our way. When you, when you react the same way they react, then they don't see any difference between you and them. You know, it is said that when the Romans would persecute the Christians and, and they would use them as, as, as uh, fun in, in the Colosseum, in the Colosseums, there's just, there, there was more than one Colosseum, by the way. There was the big one in Rome, but then there was other ones all throughout the Roman Empire. Not necessarily as big, but they had other ones too. And in these Colosseums, they would take and they would uh, uh, you know, put Christians in there and they'd let the gladiators cut them up or they would, you know, uh, uh, you know, stick the lions and other animals on them and so forth and so on. And what the people saw in the stands, like a football game, but, you know, the Christians were the football. <laughs> and what the people in the, in, in the stands saw, they, they didn't see him crying out and screaming and, and running and hiding. They saw them standing. And they would see these Christians singing, singing hymns and praises unto God as they were being attacked by lions, as the gladiators were cutting. And they would sit there, and, and many times they would wonder, what is it about these people? 
How can they, how can they sit there and, or, or stand there and, and, and not run? And not, you know, in, in fact, it got to a point where it was, it was no longer sport. It was no fun because they weren't doing what they were expecting them to do. And why didn't they do that? Because they reacted different in adversity. See, in adversity, most people react in, a, in, a, in an emotional way. But they reacted in a spiritual way. They didn't look at the, 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 the lions and the, the gladiators and all that they were suffering. They didn't look at that as the end. They saw it as the beginning. They didn't see it as the, the cessation of life. They saw it as a continuation of life. See, it's from your perspective, you understand what I'm saying? And so they no longer looked at it like, oh man, you know, they won't kill me. They looked at it as, I'm going to be with Jesus. Take the, take the, take the evangelist Stephen. We, we find a, a nice uh, a couple of chapters about him in the book of uh, Acts. And here this man was preaching the gospel to the Jewish folks and to the Jewish leaders and ministering to them. What, what, and, he, and he just doesn't tell them about Jesus. He goes all the way back through their history, all the way back in the genealogy, and he's, beginning, he's bringing it forward, all the way, connecting the dots until he gets to Jesus and saying, see, he's the one that all these folk were talking about. And he, gets, and he gets to that point talking about Jesus and he's talking about the wonderful things of Jesus. Well, now the Jewish leaders are getting angry. They're getting upset. They're getting mad because they knew what they had just done several years earlier. They had crucified the Lord of glory. And so they're angry because somebody's bringing up to them what they had done. And so they decide to stone him. But Stephen doesn't react the way that most folk would react to stoning. He didn't, re now, you, and most of us, we hear about stoning, we say, oh, yeah, yeah, stoning, okay. You don't realize stoning was, was rough. I mean, they didn't take pebbles and hit you with it. You know, they took big rocks. And when you were stoned, you were stoned until you were dead. You know, they didn't stop until you took your last breath. And, and so they began to curse him and, and, and began to stone him. But he shouted out with a loud voice as he was being stoned. He didn't say, oh, oh, God save me. He said, he said, I see the heavens open. He said, and I see Jesus. I see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of majesty. He said, I see God and I see my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, that made him even matter, matter still. And they began to chunk bigger rocks at him and stone. And to, but you know, he didn't react the way. And I'm telling you, I guarantee you, there was a man named Saul who was there at that stoning, holding the coats of those who were stoning him, who was, who was in agreement with what they were doing, by the way. Little did he know the effect that that scene would have on his life. Little did he know that he would face the same thing, except God would raise him up so that he can continue on with the mission that God had given him. Little did he know what he was going to go through before Jesus. In fact, Jesus said about Saul, he said, he's going to suffer many things for my name's sake. Now you may say, that's not, a, that's not his best life. Yes, it was. See, that was his best life. That's what he was raised for. That's what God made him for. To go out and preach the gospel all over the world. He was, going, he was made to suffer. And you know something? Paul never said, Wait, why do I have to suffer such? He took it gladly. He realized and understood that whatever suffering I face on this earth is nothing compared to the glory that I will see when I get to heaven. Glory to God. And as to what, see that, that is a different attitude. It's a different attitude. It's a different way of looking at things. And so as saints of God, we, we ought to have a different attitude. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. See, you got to have, you have that, a different attitude. Jesus wasn't on the cross saying, get me down. Jesus was on the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Different attitude. Was Jesus living his best life? You better believe he was. But they tried to kill him every time he looked around. That was still his best life because he was there for a purpose. He was there for a reason. 
He was there to raise up a group of people to go and preach the gospel all over the world. And the culmination of his life was to hang on a cross and take the sins of the world on his shoulders, past, present, and future. Purpose. See, you live your best life not because of ease. You live your best life for the purpose of God to glorify him and to bring him all the glory, honor, and praise. Purpose. Come on, come on, somebody. Turn to your neighbor and say, I got purpose. Glory to God. During hardships, suffering, pain, disappointments, Whatever you're going through, whatever you face, your response. See, I know what the world's response is going to be to those things, but our response ought to be a response to show others that the character of God is inside of us. That we're not living according to the character of the world. We've got the character of God inside of us. Not the character of the world. Glory to God. The allure we ought to have as Christians is that we're as different from the world as night is today. We're as different from the world as night is today. I'm going to shift gears here for just a second, but you'll see where I'm going. What makes us made in the image of God? It's not our human form, not two eyes, two legs, and, you know, nose and all that. It's not our human emotions. No. What makes us made in the image of God is the character of God. See, we're made in his image. We reflect God's character. We exhibit his character every day in our lives. Galatians 5, verse 22 through 25. Listen to what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit... But the fruit of the Spirit, huh? That means the Spirit brings fr some fruit, bears some fruit. And that fruit is love, joy, peace. I'm not talking about the cessation of war. I'm talking about the peace that passes all understanding. I'm talking about the peace that you have in the midst of war. When, when everything is going crazy all around you and the bombs are dropping and everything else, but you're walking in a peace, you're walking in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a place where, where it doesn't matter what's going on around you, you've got peace with God. I, that's the peace I'm talking about. I'm not talking about love where, oh, I love you and you love me. I'm talking about a love that is deeper than that. But listen, here's the, here's the deepest kind of love there is, and it's found, over in, the, it's found in the Bible, one scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Do whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the kind of love. You know, hey, love is love. No, love is not love. Human love does not even compare to the love of God. Does not even compare. When we talk about love, we're talking about the kind of love that says, I'm going to sacrifice my own for the betterment of others. Mm. Now you, ain't, you don't find that too much in the world. <laughs> I, I challenge you to find that just about any place in the world. So, so, the, so here we got the, the fruit of the Spirit. So love, the kind of love that sacrifices. Joy, the joy that, that no matter what's going on, you still have a joy because you know who you serve. Peace that passes understanding. A peace in the midst of the storm that you still have because the storm is nothing but a storm. But the peace you have comes from God. You have peace with God. Long suffering. Long suffering. Being able to understand and see what, uh, what, what, what's going on with other people and have, a, have an empathy. Doesn't mean you agree. That mean you, doesn't mean you, you put your stamp of approval on it. See, sometimes people, oh, well, well, you know, if you love them, you, no, 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 no. I don't put my stamp of approval on your, on your evil, on, on your sin. I can empathize where you've been and what you're going through and help you understand there's a way out. Come on now. That's what God did. God was long-suffering with us, but he said, but I'm going to give you a way out. It's up to you to take it. 
kindness, goodness, faithfulness. These are all the characteristics of God. Gentleness, self-control. Oh, could you imagine if God had no self-control? You know, you, you've heard the term poor impulse control. That means lack of self-control. That means just you, you lack self-control. Could you imagine if God had poor impulse control? If he just did things impulsively? We wouldn't be here. <laughs> we, we wouldn't be here. So we find these nine fruits of the Spirit. Let me, let me give you a definition of character. It's the aggregate of features and traits that form the individual nature of some person or thing. The aggregate of features and traits. In other words, the, the, all, all these things together that form the individual nature. So we find that these are the things that form the nature the character of Christ. So when you talk about the fruit of the Spirit, you're talking about the character of Christ. This is his character. When we go through each one of these things, we find out this is exactly how Jesus operated. He operated in, 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 with the epitome of love. You wouldn't go on a cross if you didn't love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He was the epitome of each and every single one of those attributes. So the fruit of the Spirit, you have to recognize, is the character of Christ. Amen? And his work, listen to this, his work in us enables us to take on that character. That's why he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is. But the fruit of the Spirit is. Listen, I didn't finish reading everything, did I? Let me finish it. The next verse. Against such, there is no law. And those who are Christ, wait a minute, listen, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, in other words, passions and desires that are contrary to the things of God. He says, so if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So he's letting us know. Now he let us know what the, 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 the things of the flesh are earlier in chapter 5. Then he goes on to tell us what the fruit of the Spirit is, the contrast, that which is of the flesh and that which is of the Spirit. Those things that are the character of the flesh and those things that are the character of Christ. Amen. And he says, against such there is no law. How can there be a law against any part of the character of Christ? So he's letting us know in this that no matter what, you don't have to worry about anything concerning the law in these nine things, in these nine attributes. And because you are in Christ, your flesh has been crucified. Oh, my, my, my. Every passion and every desire of your flesh, because the passions and the desires of your flesh are no good anyway. He said, it has been crucified. So now you walk by the Spirit, and it's the Spirit and the power of the Spirit that brings those attributes of the character of Christ in you, so now you live like him. Come on, somebody. Now, a great exchange has taken place in your life when you got saved. There was an exchange that happened. Jesus took your sin on himself, and in exchange, we received his Holy Spirit. That's the exchange. He took your sin and gave you his spirit. I think we get the better end of that deal. I don't think God is a bad bargainer. I think he wants that deal. He wants to give us that deal. It wasn't, it wasn't because he didn't know what, what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was doing. Because of his love for us. To reconcile us back to himself. So now we see as the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit produces this transformation in our lives, the sin in me now is replaced with the fruit or the character of Christ. 
So the sin I once did, I don't do anymore because now it's been replaced. I've been transformed, glory to God, I've been transformed now to receive these attributes that are the character of Christ in my life. So instead of committing the sin of the flesh, I now commit the attributes of the Spirit. And, and instead of obeying the flesh and its sinful lust and desires, I now obey the Spirit's Woo. I now obey the spirit and all the desires and passions of the character of Christ. I'm truly now a new man in God. I'm a new man because before I, I was a slave to this and I had to do this. Now I have something else. I have the character of Christ and I want to do this. There's a difference between you, you have no choice on one hand and now over here your desire is to obey and do the things of God. I want to be more like Christ. I want to live a life that is empowered by the Holy Ghost and that it reflects the anointing and power and majesty of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to have that kind of life because if I'm living a kingdom life, i got to reflect the reign of the King. Glory to God. God has a goal that he's already decided for you. And that goal is to conform you into the likeness of his son Jesus. That's his goal. That's his goal, to conform you into the likeness of his son Jesus. That's our destiny. That's living your best life, is being like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Listen to what the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, 29, 30, 31. And we know, and we know that all things work together for good. Oh, I got to say that again. And we know, not we hope, not we guess, not sort of, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt there's no guessing here. We know that all things, no matter what it is, no matter how good it is, no matter how bad it is, no matter if it's devastating or no matter if, if it's the thing that brings us ecstatic joy, we know that all things work together for good. In other words, it can be the worst thing that happens to me, but it's going to work around to my good. It can be the best thing that happened to me, and it's still going to be to my good. All things work together for good to who? Those who love God. That's a promise right there. To those who are the called, uh-oh, here we go, according to his purpose. See, you have a purpose. And God's going to make sure it happens in your life. Listen to what he says. For whom he foreknew. In other words, he, he knew you way ahead of time. He also predestined. He also had determined the, the trajectory of your life. To be conformed to the image of of his son. He'd already made that determination. He foreknew you and said, now when he comes into, when he comes to, to be saved, when he accepts the free gift of salvation, I'm going to conform him to the image of my dear son. Wow. That he might be, talking about Jesus, the firstborn among many brethren. In other words, Jesus is the mold that all the rest of us will fit into. He's the mold. You know, you heard they say when they made, made so-and-so, they broke the mold. When they made, when, when, when Jesus wasn't made, he's always been God. But when he, when they, when they made the mold, he didn't break it because he wanted to fit all of us into it. 
He wanted to make sure each one of us was molded into his likeness, molded into his image, to be just like him. Glory to God. So he said, the firstborn of many, many brothers, moreover, whom he predestined, he predestined you to do what? He said, oh, well, every step of my life has been already ordered. No, no, God orders your footsteps, but he predestined you to be, as a saint, to be put in the image. You got to read what it says. He predestined you to be conformed to the image. All right? So moreover whom he predestined, these he also called. Because if he's predestined you to be in the image of Christ, then he's also already called you to be, called, be in the image of Christ. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Whom he called... These he also justified. Oh, there's that justified life again. So he called you. That means he now is going to justify you. What does justify mean? I'm not guilty. I came to the courtroom and God was as, as the judge and he sat there as a judge. But I came to the courtroom with my lawyer and my lawyer's name was Jesus Christ Esquire. And when he brought that, amen. And when I came to the courtroom with my lawyer, my lawyer stepped up because, see, I don't speak for myself, but my lawyer speaks for me. Glory to God. And my lawyer said, no, he said, Father, he's one of mine. He's one of mine. He put his faith alone in me. He is saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And God said, all right. Well, in that case, bang the gavel and said, not guilty. All the charges are dropped. Dave, you are free to go. Glory to God. And like he told, like Jesus told the woman, he said, go and sin no more. You've been free. Now go and don't commit another crime. So, but wait a minute, then he says, and whom he justified found not guilty, these he also glorified. That means that, that, that there's a coming a point in time in each one of our lives when we stand before the bar of God, not because not to be found guilty or not guilty for sin, that's already been done, that's a done deal. That was done when you gave your life to Christ. But now when we stand before God, we stand before Jesus at the, at the uh, uh, beam of seat judgment, and at that one, that's where we get reward. And guess what? We'll be glorified at that point. And what does glorified mean? That means no longer will sin even be in our presence. So we've been declared not guilty, and now those he declared not guilty, he also is going to eliminate sin even out of their presence at a, at a, at a given point in history. Amen. What then shall we say to these things? He says, what, what, what can we say to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. Nobody can be against us. Your best life is a justified life. Your best life is a sanctified life. Your best life is a glorified life. Your best life is a kingdom-filled life. Your best life is when you're filled with the Holy Ghost and the character of Christ now is coming forth from you to everybody around you. And it will cause them to wonder, what do you have? Who are you? That's what they said about Jesus. Who are you? That's what they said about the disciples. Have they who turned the world upside down come here also? Who are you? That's what they said about Paul. Who are you? And we can say, I am Jesus Christ, son of the living God. His anointing and his power flows through me, and I reflect him to you today so you can come and know him as your Lord and Savior, and you, can, you too can be justified, sanctified, glorified, and live a kingdom-filled life. Glory to God. We don't fear death anymore because death was defeated by Jesus. God has declared us not guilty by our faith. Glory to God. So because we are being transformed into Christ's likeness, taking upon ourselves his character by the power of the Holy Spirit, then we operate in these four points. And I'm going to close out with these. We operate in faith that produces obedience. Faith that produces obedience. So now I'm a faith man. You're faith people. We're all faith men and women. 
and, we, and that faith in us that we had in Christ Jesus because we were obedient to bow our knee at that cross and receive him as Lord and Savior, bow our knee at that tomb and receive his resurrection as our resurrection, glory to God, we have been justified, praise God. Listen, I, because I was obedient to do that, I'm obedient the rest of the way to follow Christ each and every step of the way. We operate in a passion that produces unity. I don't, I don't look down and despise anybody, but I stand true to the things of God. See, if I have the character of Christ, then I'm not looking down at anybody. I'm looking at each and every person as potentially somebody who can be in the same position I'm in, who can have the same good life that I'm living. Every morning when you wake up, you ought to shout to the Lord, thank you, Lord, I'm living my best life. I'm living my best life in Christ Jesus. It's the power of the Holy Ghost that's transforming me so that your character is alive inside of me. Point number three, we operate also in desperation that produces prayer. A desperation that produces prayer. I'm not saying desperation like the world is desperate. I'm saying a desperation to be in touch with Jesus, to also be in communication with him, to talk with him, a desperation that produces prayer. Listen, prayer has no power, but the power is in the one who you pray to. Y'all hear what I said? See, I, 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 know, I, I know a lot of times we, the power of prayer. Well, the prayer, has, the prayer has no power, but the power is in the one you pray to. That's where the power lies. The power is not in my, in my prayer. It's, 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 like, it's like if you, if you uh, um, I'm just trying to think of an example where a lot of times we praise the thing rather than what's coming from it. You, you get what I'm saying? You know, sometimes we, 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 you know, we, we look at, uh, um, I, heard, I heard a guy say, you know, we're, 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 we're loving the pipe rather than the water that's coming from the pipe. It's the water that comes from the pipe that, that, that quenches your thirst and that does something for you. The pipe does nothing for you. The pipe is just a carrier. How many times, how many, oh yeah, hey, listen to this. How, how many times, if we, oh, you know, I just love when brother so-and-so preach. I love bishop so-and-so, or I love pastor so-and-so, or apostle so-and-so. I, I love them rather than, it's not them, they're the instrument. It's the word that comes forth. That's the life-giving flow. It's the word that comes forth. Y'all, you hear what I'm saying? And sometimes, so we got to love God more than we love the things that God uses. I, I was, I take, I would take you somewhere, but I don't have the time. But I, you, you understand what I'm saying? You, we have to, you know, God. Listen, God does things in a great way, and sometimes He doesn't do the same thing twice. And he does things in a di variety of different ways all the time. And sometimes you get so used to God working one way that you miss him working the other way because if it don't work this way, then it can't be God. But I'm here to tell you, God, you, can't, you cannot put that kind of shackle on God. You, you just can't put that. So, so, so what, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is let's not look at the things and, and, and all that. Stuff. Look at God because he's the, he's the power. So desperation, that produces prayer. That prayer goes to the one who has the power, and the one who has the power is the one who's fixing the situations for you and bringing you through the bad times and, and, and enhancing your good times. Oh, amen? And, and, finally, and finally, we operate in the Holy Spirit that produces power. The Holy Spirit that produces power. He produces the power. You know, we look at, here again, we look at a lot of things in a lot of different ways. And, and, and we key on those ways and, and those means rather than the source. And it's important that we key in on the source. It's important that we recognize it is God. It is God who has made the way for us. God. You know, if I lay hands on you and you get healed and delivered, and praise God, that's awesome. But I'm not the source. God is. 
Oh, if I run to Brother So-and-So's meeting, I'm going to get healed. How about you can get healed anyway? You don't have to be at Brother So-and-So's meeting. You can be right, you can be anywhere. God can use the old wine o to lay hands on you. Look how Jesus operated. He didn't always do the same thing twice. One black, blind guy, he spit in his eyes. Another blind guy, he laid hands on. So I mean, I mean, you know, there was just so many different ways. Jesus and God does things in a variety of ways. It's not the ways; it's the power, the Holy Spirit, who produces the power. And that's what we got to keep our eyes on all the time. I'm not saying people aren't gifted. Praise God for their gifts. I'm not saying people God hasn't gifted people to do certain things and, and bless God. And if brother so and so is gifted, let's use him. But I'm, what I am saying is still recognize who the source is. Yeah. And the source is always God. The source is always, always, always God. Amen. Y'all been blessed this morning. We are grateful you chose to join us today for Pastor Dave's teaching. If you have questions during the week or are in need of prayer, please email us at office at kingdomfirstfw.com and be sure to join us for our next broadcast. During this time, please remember to be safe, be well, and be blessed.